Hello and welcome. Today is uh, Wednesday. It is the 20th of March um, and this is the CNAB community meeting. So welcome. Uh, at the start of every meeting, uh, we actually welcome newcomers. So do we have any newcomers on the line this morning? Feel free to speak up if this is your first time. Otherwise, continue. Okay. We only have faces that have been here before. Fantastic. Okay, so I've popped the agenda up there as a link in the chat. Feel free to follow along. Um, demos. So just going down through the agenda, we have nobody listed as demos. If people want to do a demo, feel free to speak up. Um, summary of changes. Jeremy, do we need to go through that together or that's just there as a place marker? Yeah, there were actually none since the last meeting that were merged, so it's empty for this week. Okay. No changes um, as of in the last week. Thanks, Jeremy. Uh, we have please review and comment on two specific. There's an issue in Duffel um, and there's a PR in the CNAB spec. So do we need to go over those or are they? what's the current status on them? It's just an FYI. So it looks like um, CNAB spec Pull request 137 is include original image names in image map and there's a long discussion there between um, Matt and Simon, uh, Simon, sorry. Um, and I don't know if there's too much else to do on that, but there's a review section there. Okay, and there's another issue 668 on Duffel. So who opened that one? Glenn had, had, up, had opened that one. Okay, Sylvan looks like he's responded in the last 20 odd minutes. So I think we, we're okay. Um, that brings us to the discussion pieces here. Um, should custom extensions be exposed to invocation images? Who raised that and would like to talk about that? No takers, does anybody have any context on that? Okay, if there's no takers, I will continue on. What are the goals or use cases for libcnab Rust? Any takers who would like to discuss that? Uh, I can say a couple of words about it. I'm not sure uh, of any other context about that question. Essentially, it's, uh, first of all, we're learning Rust. Yeah, that's the main one. And the second one, we're, we're trying to see how, uh, so we, we already have implementations for various parts of the spec in Python by Gareth in .NET, the work that we started. And I think that's about it. And we're trying to see uh, how difficult it would be implementing different parts of the spec in different languages together with learning Rust. So if anyone wants to come along and learn Rust with us, you'd be more than welcome. Uh, at the same time, we're also trying to understand how difficult it is to... Uh, so for, for example, the uh, security part of the spec, it doesn't have any sort of libraries, so Tough and Intoto don't have libraries in Rust, for example. And we're trying to get a grasp of the difficulty of implementing those in other languages than Go. I hope that uh, that answers the question. Uh, yes, I believe so. Are there any questions or comments based on what Radu just said? Where can we actually find, is that a repository under Deus Labs, Radu? Uh, yes, I'll, I'll link it right now. Okay, thank you. By the way, I'm really sorry for turning up late. Uh, I added several agenda items and then clean forgot that we were still in the short daylight savings gap. Yes, we're in that two week phase where one has moved, but not the other. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, we can go, we can go on back. Uh, there were, there was one specific issue, 668 on Duffel. We, it looked like that was something you had raised and it just had a please review and comment. Um, was there anything specifically that needed to be mentioned about that? It looks like Sylvan had meant, commented 29 minutes yeah. ago. No, no, I just wanted to bring it to people's attention. Okay, wonderful. And there was another agenda item there. Uh, should custom extensions be exposed to invocation images? Is yeah. that 
Okay, would you like to take us through that? Um, well, I can't see the point of uh, having a custom extension that wouldn't be exposed to invocation images because it's hardly going to be very useful to runtimes. Uh, I guess it, it could be, but um, the use case I've got in mind are probably um, where uh, a base image wants to uh, have some metadata associated with it. Um, so you put that in a, um, a custom extension, but then the base image needs to be able to get hold of that custom extension when the invocation image runs. Um, so it seems sensible to, to expose it. Did anyone um, kind of say, no, this is uh, you know, a terrible idea, we mustn't do it? Actually, about extension, I, I think we uh, we should handle um, additional properties on pretty much every, every node in uh, in the schema, um, so that we can enrich it uh, for tools that may want to add uh, additional metadata at some points on in uh, in the window. Right, you're talking about kind of scattering extra metadata through the schema. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I see uh, many reasons for that, like uh, being able to, uh, um, for example, have uh, a UI uh, present parameters with uh, friendly names, uh, plus description, plus I, I don't know. Maybe. So yeah, I, I guess we there, there is room for uh, adding purely uh, non-functional things in the, in the schema, uh, like arbitrary metadata pretty much everywhere. Okay. I mean, that, that wasn't really the scope of the uh, question. Um, I, I take it, it's a good, good idea, but I don't want to um, uh, creep the scope too much. Uh, it was really just the, the existing uh, custom extension uh, area of the schema. Um, I just wondered if, if we could uh, expose that to invocation images. Uh, while we're uh, discussing this, wouldn't a single field that holds extension metadata be enough? Why would you need to scatter it across multiple fields? Uh, the obvious example is that uh, the, uh, the image map is injected in the inv invocation image. So if we could have uh, extensions in there, it would allow us to uh, pass additional info in, uh, in the invocation image space. Would dotted names in a in a big extension field work? You could get information from there. Yeah, but we would have to modify the the runtime implementation to inject that somehow uh, into the invocation image as well. Okay, I, I see. Okay, let's let's continue the discussion. It's an interesting one. Okay, um, I think what I'll do is um, raise an issue to cover this and then link it to the. Um, uh, the meeting notes, so anyone that's interested can follow up after the meeting. How, do, how does that sound? Plus one all around. Good, good idea. Yeah, okay. We're done with that then. Thank you. Um, do you know, this, this is the recording to find out about goals and use cases for Rust. Yes, um, there were some cliff notes and I know there's some notes in the agenda that Jeremy had captured regarding that, so um okay, thank you and jason jason schema support yeah um i put this in there so ryan and i have been kind of working on a pr to introduce um, a way for people to define uh, a schema type within their parameters so that we can introduce more complicated objects like arrays and objects um and through our kind of like time working on that PR, we realized that the CNAP spec is just subtly different from the JSON spec in, um, in ways that you wouldn't necessarily realize at first glance until you actually took a look at them and tried to work on a PR like this. So we were kind of wondering um, if it would be possible to you have the CNAP specification adopt the JSON um, spec wholly, especially when it comes to property types um, and have additional properties like the ones that we have for, I think, um, destination and things like that that we require be the additional ones that we specify. 
to to be completely clear about this subject, it's for parameters that actually all data as a JSON object. I'm sorry, can you say that again? Um, uh, I guess the uh, the objective is to enrich validation for parameters that uh, whose values is actually a JSON payload. Y yes, I think. Yeah, that's that's something I I'd like to see in the future. But um, I think we we should take a broader aspect because um, many bundles might might have parameters that are not uh, JSON, but that require some complex validation as well. And I'd like to to see first a, a, a generic uh, approach that is uh, some kind of runtime uh, validation, so that when you run the invocation image, we can uh, report uh, parameter validation uh, errors in a way that the, uh, the runtime uh, can in a way that the runtime can understand and report to the user um, properly. So, so, so this, uh, this uh, was something I like to, to see first because yeah, not everyone is using JSON and if we can do uh, runtime validation first, it can be uh, used for JSON parameter validations as well as the YAML or anything like tables that expect to have a certain layout or something like that. So I'm not sure I understand where the, the validation you're assuming would happen in, not inside of the bundle, but in uh, not inside of the invocation image, but in the, the CNAB runtime itself, right? Matt, who are you asking? Uh, Simone, oh. <clears throat> uh, for for the for for the proposal, if I understand correctly, it's something that we we want to have at at uh, at the runtime level, and that doesn't require uh, running the invocation image. It's a yeah. It's a validation inside the file or or Docker app or anything. Uh, what I suggest is first that we take an approach where we actually embed the validation logic in uh, the uh, invocation image, and we uh, we specify a way to report uh, validation parameter validation uh, issues in a meaningful way, like having a special exit code and having um, a JSON schema for reporting uh, parameter validation errors. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm having a hard time figuring out where, how this relates too much. So if parameters are validated um, by the CNAB runtime before the invocation image is started up, then we don't have to get particularly prescriptive about anything as to how it handles errors. It just has to, that's between the runtime author and their user base, right? And yes. this proposal as it is only requires that the runtime be able to understand JSON schema to validate data before it's injected into the invocation image. So that seems to me like it's kind of orthogonal to passing any error codes from the invocation image back, unless I'm missing. Yeah, uh, actually, let, let's take an example. Um, if we, um, if this kind of uh, validation should apply not only on uh, JSON uh, parameters, but also on uh, on anything else. If you take the exam an exam a pure exa pure uh, theoretical example of a Helm uh, generic uh, Synab that would take uh, a Helm uh, package as a tarball uh, in a parameter, you might want to indicate in a, in a very formal way that the uh, parameter is invalid because uh, the table has not the correct layout. It's not a valid uh, Elm chart. Um, and this this kind of runtime validation, if we, if we get a, a first class validation, uh, parameter validation at runtime thing, we can handle uh, arbitrary uh, kind of data, not just JSON. And it doesn't mean that uh, in the future we can add things that happen earlier in the in in the stack like doing 
uh, JSON schema based validation. And, and also having a runtime validation means that you can express things that you can't do de declaratively, like uh, having, yeah, you know, uh, making sure that uh, the, the values that we uh, that we have put, even if they respect a particular uh, regex or something like that, are actually meaningful in in the context of the invocation. Yeah, I, so I, I think I agree that that, was, that that's something we want to have in the future. I, I think my only disagreement is that I don't think it should block the JSON schema thing since that's part of this structure. I don't think so. Let me think about it. I'll respond on the issue queue because I want to think about that a little more. Um, yeah. I guess in like bringing this up, uh, there's the kind of situation you get into is something that looks like, at least for the parameter section of the specification, something that looks very much like JSON schema, uh, but is not at all JSON schema and has like some subtly different things like bytes is not a thing in JSON schema. JSON schema would have handled that with something like a type string format key binary. Um, that then has like a semantic meaning within the invocation image, like, oh, this string that I'm receiving is actually binary. I should treat it as like base64 encoded bytes or something like that. Um, uh, there, there, there is um, a difference uh, also with, with that is that uh, a valid string uh, in a JSON document is quoted, uh, but a JSON parameter, um, uh, Synab parameter of type string is Directly the the string that I and it's it's not embedded in a in a JSON string, so it's uh, for me it's something I I understand that it's pretty close to uh, the constraint you can put on parameter on uh, on JSON uh, fields and things like that, but it's still we are still not validating um, actual JSON payloads. We are validating strings or uh, Boolean values, etc. Sure. Uh, I mean, maybe I can describe a little bit more like our runtime use case. Like in our runtime, we actually have a JSON API that's actually receiving a set of parameters as a JSON payload. So for us, this becomes like pretty painful of a interaction experience where like if you have keys that are just defined as like integers or booleans or strings, those things come in looking like a regular JSON payload. But as soon as you get something slightly more complex, like an array or even just like a small object, you then have like weird situations where you have stuff that looks like JSON embedded as a string and then escaped within a JSON payload. Just, it's just kind of a gnarly user experience for us that we try to want to like we'd want to avoid that kind of situation if we could yeah that, that comes also to uh, a discussion about um, is a bundle uh, JSON format uh, supposed to be uh, readable or is it purely something that we that tools should work on and should the user be exposed to the bundle JSON I I, I don't think so, but it's uh, it's purely my opinion. All right, I'll have to catch up on the issue in the chatter that happened on that yesterday, but I'll weigh in on the issue queue after. So there is an issue open for that one? that specific discussion around JSON schema? It's kind of falling out of our initial proposal. This is like issue 114. And we kind of broke up that um, into two different things. And one was to pull a PR in that was going to support these complex objects. And that conversation is happening in the CNAB Slack. Um, so I can link the beginning of that conversation. Um, but if you all want to keep it in the 114 issue, we can do that as well. <clears throat> yeah, I, uh, at this point, it might make sense to move it to a PR, to actually PR the spec change in and debate it there, because uh, I think we're probably at that point. OK, we can do that, and we can have a discussion on, on a PR. Yeah. That's
that issue is getting a little unwieldy and hard to follow because it's gone a few ways, but I think we now have two pretty clear PRs falling out of it. One is to allow standard in as a, as a uh, destination, and the other one is to add JSON schema uh, support is, as a, to support objects and arrays and subtypes in uh, parameter types. Okay, so just going through the agenda, that's all we had on the initial agenda. Was there any demos? Did anybody want to do a demo today? Okay, lazy consensus says no. Um, and with items that wanted to be added or discussed right now, um, as we are at the end of the documented agenda. <clears throat> Uh, yeah, there, there was a subject I, I wanted to uh, talk about. It's uh, the subject of fig bundle and air gapped um, uh, environments. And <clears throat> the way I, I saw this at first with fig bundle was uh, that it solved only uh, the distribution part of the problem, which is having a single package containing both images and uh, and uh, cinema metadata but the problem that we have is that if you if you take the example of uh, of a compose uh, synab or something like that um we uh, are the, the, the invocation image will have to embed the logic to um, provision the images on the on the, on the cluster um so there, we had a discussion with uh, with Matt about uh, what we uh, envision for air gap scenarios is that uh, at least for for Docker images, um, uh, we we should have a, a registry in uh, in the air gap, uh, a private registry in the air gap environment. And so, what would happen is actually uh, that. We we would relocate all the uh, images in in this registry, but if we take this approach, I wonder if we really need thing bundles at all. Because actually, if you look at uh, our Synap to CI work, we we don't need thing bundles to do that. We we can just copy things from one registry to the other um, and be done with it. So I. Coming from Docker, I only uh, uh, have in my scope the, the, the case of uh, container images. So there might be uh, over considerations related to uh, a VM driver or something like that. But my my first guess is that I I, I think the fig, the whole fig bundle story is might not be uh, really needed needed at all. I think we have to have thin bundles until we can solve the registry-like problem for virtual machines or and, and other runtimes, because uh, there's currently no way to, uh, the, I, the idea of pulling down, you know, six or eight uh, 20 gig images and packing them into a, any kind of representation would be uh, hard for a regular user story. Um, yeah, I guess so. And yeah. Um, I can't imagine, and uh, although I can't imagine having a fig bundle of uh, of 50 gigs uh, because I have uh, three uh, three VMs in it, uh, uh, yeah, it doesn't it doesn't fit in my in most of my uh, USB keys, and <laughs> so yeah, I'm I, I, I'm really not sure about this uh, fig bundle thing. I for VMs, I guess that we could have something similar to what the registry is for uh, for docker images like replacing the word registry to some kind of file share or something like that and if we take a similar approach like being able to rewrite the, the bundle uh, image locations i guess that might that might work correctly but yeah it's just uh i, I i'm not um Familiar enough with uh, the whole VM driver uh, case uh, to, to think about it. I, I know that for the uh, container based um, synapse, we really don't need fig, fig bundle now that we have relocation. Yeah. yeah. I wonder if we yeah. can extrapolate for VM. Okay. Yeah, if we, if we can, that would be a good goal to have because I'm really liking the way that the synapse OCI stuff is working in practice. 
yeah, I was going to go back to the Docker case, Docker image case. And I think, yeah, it's great to copy uh, the images during relocation. If you've got a, uh, like a DMZ or something, which has got access to both a private registry and the internet, um, there may be some customers who have more secure environments that are really locked down. I'm thinking of government agencies and such like GCHQ, these kind of places uh, where you don't have internet access at all and you need to obtain your bytes, um, you know, by some means, some of the means, carry a pigeon or something and then install them. Um, but also um, for long-term support, uh, registries come and go and uh, it might be uh, a thick bundle that can get around that problem by capturing all the images and making them available and then you know 10 years down the road you've still got them so you know i think it's a minor use case but it might be important for some some customers yes yeah, so the problem is that running uh, directly from a fig bundle uh, is not supported yet so maybe it's more something like um we should give this responsibility to uh, to a distribution tool. We we could, for example, do uh, exactly uh, exactly that with Synap to OCI, like being able to um, grab uh, a Synap OCI index uh, and all its uh, its uh, dependencies, like all image image manifest and blobs, etc. Put that into a package that we can uh, read rate in, into. Uh, into another registry uh, without having to go through the, through uh, a GMZ. But we, we, we can do that with uh, with pu purely with the Synap to CI tool and not having this notion of fig bundle in, uh, in the spec for that. Right. Yeah, I mean, I, I was thinking about this in the context of the um, uh, Duffel Relocate um, code that I'm currently writing um, because we've got code around at the moment, which would take uh, images from an OCI image layout and then uh, push them to a private registry during relocation. Uh, so we could do that d during uh, uh, Duffel relocate. So, you know, we could make Duffel relocate do um, the kind of thick bundle case or the thin bundle case, you know, do the copying either way. Um... Oh, you mean, uh, yeah, if you have a thick bundle, having, uh, using the fault to provision the, thing, uh, the whole thing inside a, a private registry, that's, that's, a, that's another approach. The, the thing is that I, I'm not uh, completely sure that we need to have that into a, a CDAP representation because for, for a, a registry uh, a publishing tool point of view, it's, it might be easier to just work with a graph of manifest and blobs um, and not having to uh, extract information from uh, the Synap fig uh, package. I... Right, yeah, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it wouldn't be Synap specific, it'd just be a tool that grabs an OCI image layout, for example, and then stores all the images in the private registry. Um... Yeah, um, I mean, I, I don't, in our use cases, we don't really see the CNAB being stored in a registry. The CNAB itself, it's just the images. Um, you know, we, we haven't quite got to that step yet. Um, so in those kind of setups, you, you could kind of um, obtain the bundle by some other means and then uh, relocate it and push the images up. And you know, the bundle wouldn't necessarily get pushed to the uh, private registry, but there's a need for that. Yeah, and that should be, that should be doable within bundles now. I mean, by design, that was part of our intention was to be able to move around small pieces of configuration when you're all sharing the same registry for your invocation image and other images. Um, so that, that should be, that, that is one of our design goals. So, um, yeah. I was going to list off some of the other user cases we had for secure networks, but um, um, I don't, we can do that in an issue or something. I don't want to belabor the meeting with that. Um, but one, for example, that has come up multiple times is uh, only CDs are allowed across, only CD-ROMs are allowed across one of the security borders. So whatever we put on it has to has to be put onto CD-ROM on one side and then 
manually moved across the security border. Um, but you know that's a distinct uh, requirement, different from being able to run a, a thick bundle, you know, without any registry support. So, uh, but I can I'll, I'll try and document some of those because we have some interesting IoT cases and some interesting edge computing cases as well as high security cases. Yeah, I think it makes it makes sense to uh, kind of list all the air gapped uh, scenarios that we want to handle and just go through them and uh, and see if we can handle them just purely with uh, Synap to OCI or if we are uh, if we uh, really need to have a uh, thick bundles for some of them I, I think it will tremendously uh, simplify the spec if we are uh, if we could get rid of that Okay, thank you. Is there anything else folks would like to discuss? Okay, well, I think we're ready to call it. We can wrap up the meeting. Um, I'd like to say thank you to Jeremy for taking notes and everybody for joining. Um, the, uh, this recording will be posted on YouTube uh, in the next couple of days. So if you'd like to catch up on the conversations that were had, you can do it there. Um, otherwise, you can take a look at the agenda um, and we'll see you all at uh, next week's meeting. Thanks for joining. Bye. 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 Bye.